Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Oli Foundation webinar, Medical Management of Short Bowel Syndrome, Growing the Intestines and the Child, generously sponsored by Nine Meters Biopharma. My name is Andrea Guidi. I am the Director of Educational Programs and Initiatives here at the Oli Foundation. Most of you are probably familiar with the Oli Foundation, but just in case this is your first experience with us, I'd like to briefly introduce our organization. The Oli Foundation strives to enrich the lives of those living with home nutrition support, both intravenous nutrition, sometimes called HPN or TPN, and tube feeding. We do this through education, outreach, and networking. The Oli Foundation was founded in 1983 by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient, Clarence Oli Oldenburg. Today, we serve approximately 25,000 members. All of our programs are free of charge for patients and their families. Before we get into the presentation today, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping details. You should see a toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat function to send a message directly to myself or Dr. Kimber. In the Q&A function, please type your questions you have for Dr. Kimber. Note, we will not be responding to the hand raising function in the control panel. And we would like everyone to, it, we encourage everyone to put their questions in the Q&A function. Uh, we just don't like, it's, it's easier in there rather than the chat because we don't want to lose track of them as the chat tends to move pretty fast during the presentation. I will be posting a recording of this presentation um, on our webinar um, page on the OLI website. Please note we've muted all of our participants, so you don't need to worry if there's any background noise where you're taking this webinar. If you have any technical issues, please go to the Zoom website at the address on your screen. And now for the presentation. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Savan Kinberg. Dr. Kinberg is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, and the director of the Pediatric Intestinal Rehabilitation Center at Columbia University Medical Center. She is board certified in pediatrics, pediatric gastroenterology, and clinical informatics. Her primary clinical and research interests are in intestinal failure, short bowel syndrome, intestinal rehabilitation, and home parental nutrition. She leads a multidisciplinary intestinal rehabilitation team that cares for children and young adults with intestinal failure and short bowel syndrome. We are thankful to have you presenting here today, Dr. Kimberg. So at this point, I will turn my screen over to Dr. Kimberg. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm just going to share my screen. So the title of my presentation is Medical Management of Short Bowel Syndrome, Growing the Intestines and the Child. Um, and I added on and the child here because it's such an important aspect of pediatric management of short bowel syndrome um, because it's very different than in adults and in pediatrics, we really wanna focus on the child's growth and development um, as well as, as the medical aspect. So these are our learning objectives today. We're going to understand the definition and etiologies of short bowel syndrome. We'll describe recent therapeutic advances in the medical management of short bowel syndrome, and we'll recognize the challenges for the future of intestinal rehabilitation. So starting off with some definitions, um, and some of these definitions have changed over the last few years. In general, the conditions that we're talking about are serious and chronic conditions um, that result from a loss of bowel absorptive area and or functionality. And these le this leads to nutrition deficits, um, which is clinically characterized by diarrhea, malabsorption, fluid and electrolyte disturbances, feeding intolerance, and malnutrition. The umbrella term that we use is intestinal failure. Um, and this is defined as inability of the GI tract to sustain life without supplemental parental nutrition for at least 60 days. And short bowel syndrome is the most common cause of intestinal failure. Um, and this results from physical loss of part of the intestine, um, which is usually due to a surgical resection, 
uh, but it can also be something that a child is born with, so a congenital disorder. Um, and it also includes loss of functionality. Um, and that's very important um, because it's not only the length of the intestine that is remaining that is important, it's also how it is functioning. So what are the most common causes um, in pediatric intestinal failure? So first of all, it's very different than in adults. Um, in adults, it's usually a condition that arises um, as a complication of something else that, that occurs all of a sudden in adulthood. For example, an acute ischemic event or complication of severe Crohn's disease um, or different motility conditions that result um, in inability to use the GI tract. Um, in children, it's different because it usually either starts right at birth or soon after birth. Um, and again, short bowel syndrome is the most common cause that, of intestinal failure. We see it most commonly due to necrotizing enterocolitis, which is much more common in preterm infants, but can occur in full-term babies as well. Gastroschisis, where a child is born with the intestines outside of the body. Um, this is different than a, a similar condition called omphalocele. Um, in gastroschisis, the intestines in utero are exposed to amniotic fluid. Um, and that often results in damage to the intestines um, that leads to either part of the intestine being resected or um, the intestine not working well, this motility condition. Whereas in omphalocele, the intestines are protected in utero, and usually that does not result in short bowel syndrome. You can have congenital intestinal atresias um, where you are missing either part of the duodenum, jejunum, or ileum, or all of the above. Um, malrotation with volvulus, which often presents um, with bilious vomiting soon after birth. Um, complications of hernias, intussusception, severe Crohn's disease, abdominal traumas, and radiation enteritis. Then there are other conditions, and this is why we, we group all of this together under this umbrella term intestinal failure, because um, there are congenital enteropathies in which a child is born with all of their intestines, um, but there is something wrong with in the, the villi of the intestines. Those are the finger-like projections that we have in the small intestine that are responsible for absorption. Um, and these are mouth shapes. So they, this is one of the conditions is called tufting enteropathy where the villi are shaped as tufts. And another one is microvillus inclusion disease where the villi are actually underneath the surface so they are not able to work. And then we also added on dysmotility conditions under this umbrella term because the management again is very similar. Um, so this can be Hirschsprung's disease. Um, when you have total intestinal Hirschsprung's or total intestinal ganglionosis, again, you're born with a full length of intestine but it's not a good portion of it is not working, leading to um, usually a diverting ostomy so that um, you can put the part of the intestine that is working out into that functional ostomy. Um, and other conditions like pediatric intestinal pseudo obstruction um, or burden syndrome, which is associated um, with urologic symptoms as well. And then there are other conditions such as immunodeficiencies, um, and genetic conditions that can result um, again in, in malabsorption and the need for parental nutrition. So what are the prognostic factors? So I mentioned before the length of the remaining small intestine is very important for us to know. Um, and the only way that we know an accurate length is from the surgeon's operative reports. Um, so anytime the surgeon goes into the bowel, it's very important that they measure the remaining intestines. Um, and we talk about measurements from something called the ligament of trites, uh, which is a connection between the duodenum and the jejunum. Um, and the surgeons will use that point because anatomically it's easier to identify. So they start measuring at, at that point. Um, in children that have severe short bowel syndrome, they might be missing that ligament of trites, um, the missing bowel from that point on. So the measurement might have to be from the pylorus, um, which is um, beginning of the small intestine from, from, the, from the duodenum. So it's very important for us to know how much is there and what is left. So whether a child has a jejunum, ileum, or colon is very important. Um, we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but there's a process called intestinal adaptation where the remaining intestines learns to adapt and compensate for the part that was lost. Um, and if a child has an ileum, that ileum is much better at adapting than the jejunum is. Having an ileocecal valve is helpful. So that's the connection between the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, and it serves to kind of stop um, flow of stool from the small intestine into the colon. And it also helps prevent bacterial overgrowth so bacteria coming from the large intestine into the small intestine. Um, but we have a lot more focus on the large intestine in the last few years, because um, we realize that it really plays a big role and that it probably does go through an, a, a, quite an extensive adaptation process because we see that children that have a substantial amount of colon left do much better, even if they don't have that much small intestine. 
And again, going back to function, the physiological status of the remaining intestine is very important. So just talking a little bit when we talk about length, what is our expected intestinal anatomy? So comparing this to adults um, who have 600 centimeters of small bowel and 150 centimeters of colon, a term neonate will have around 250 centimeters of small intestine and 40 centimeters of colon. Preterm infants, because they are born prematurely, have less. So the more preterm you are, the less intestines you're going to have. Um, and one thing that's important to note that in the last trimester, the length of the jejunum, ileum, and colon doubles. So a preterm infant has better gut growth potential, meaning that if we say a, a, a baby born at 27 weeks was measured to have 20 centimeters, that will continue to grow and that they will have better prognosis than, than a full-term infant or an older child that is left with 20 centimeters. Just going back a little bit again to numbers, we've moved away from this quite a bit, um, but just because this does come up um, and it does help us when we're talking about prognosis. So we define short bowel syndrome as a resection leaving less than 75 centimeters if you don't have that colon incontinuity or a resection leaving less than 20 to 40 centimeters with a colon incontinuity. And enteral autonomy, meaning that they are enterally sufficient that children do not need parental support um, to properly grow and have all of the nutrition. You need a 50, 15 centimeters of jejunum and ileum with that ileocecal valve and colon. And if you don't have the ileocecal valve and colon, you need at least 40 centimeters. Again, it's important to, to note this one more time is that this is all dependent on normal functioning of the remaining bowel. So if you have a child that has 150 centimeters of bowel that is remaining, but it's very dilated and the motility is very poor, they might depend on um, parental support for much longer than a child who has 50 centimeters of bowel that is working very well. We divide short bowel syndrome into three different types. Um, so on the left is type one. So these are patients that usually have an angiogenostomy, meaning they've lost part of the jejunum, all of the ileum, and all of the colon. Um, these patients usually require long-term parental support. Um, if they have a substantial amount of small intestine left, they do have the potential to wean off of parental support. Type two patients, which are the most common patients that we see, are patients that have a jejunal colic anastomosis, meaning they've lost part of the jejunum, all of the ileum, and part of the colon. Um, depending on how much colon they have left, they might be able to wean off parental support, again, depending on the function. Um, so these are our patients that usually do require parental support for some time, but are often with medical management able to be weaned off. Um, and type three patients are patients that have a jejunal ileal colic anastomosis. So these patients have the best prognosis, they have the most intestines. These are patients that have lost um, a small portion of either jejunum or ileum, but they have their terminal ileum, they have the ileocecal valve, and they have a full colon in continuity. Um, and again, I stress the importance of incontinuity because if you have a jejunostomy, but you have a colon that is in the body and just not connected, um, you do want to try to connect the patient as soon, if, if possible and as soon as possible to get all of the remaining bowel um, in continuity and working together. So I touched on this a little bit before, but there's this process of intestinal adaptation that occurs. Um, and this starts off within the first 24 to 48 hours after an intestinal resection. Um, and it can continue for several months or, or, or years in children. And you can see over here in the image, uh, this is a depiction of normal villi. And what happens in intestinal adaptation is that the remaining intestine goes through multiple changes to try to compensate and adapt for the part that was lost. Um, and this includes mucosal hyperplasia, villus lengthening, so the villi get longer, crypt deepening, so, and all of these things work together to increase the absorptive capacity. Um, and there's also a phenomenon of bowel dilatation that is very common in children with short bowel syndrome that undergo adaptation. Um, and that we'll often see when we get imaging, we get x-rays, the bowel is quite dilated. Um, and an important note is that this process of intestinal adaptation is stimulated by oral and enteral nutrition and hormones. So the more we stimulate the bowel, the more adaptation will occur. And then we'll go on to talk about some complications that occur in resections. One that we see very commonly is gastric acid hypersecretion, um, meaning that the, there's too much acid produced in the stomach. Um, and this can happen when you have a massive intestinal resection, especially of jejunum. Normally there's a feedback mechanism to the stomach to decrease gastric acid production. 
when you lose the intestines, you lose that feedback mechanism. And this results in get increased gastric acid production. Um, it can present with obvious symptoms such as increased leaking from a G-tube, um, increased vomiting, reflux symptoms, but it can also be more subtle and present um, with increased diarrhea or increased ostomy outputs. Um, and it can also lead to um, denaturing of pancreatic enzymes with, which further inhibits uh, absorption. Um, so we have to manage this um, by decreasing that gastric acid production and this can help with vomiting, it can also help with diarrhea. There's rapid intestinal transit. These patients have less intestines so everything that, that, that they're eating and drinking will move much faster. There's loss of surface area. There's bacterial overgrowth, which I touched upon before. Um, and again, this can happen with any surgical resection. It is more common if you lose the ileocecal valve, but any surgical procedure can result in, in an imbalance of bacteria. Bile acid malabsorption can occur in patients that have lost the terminal ileum. Um, so normally bile acids are produced by the liver. They get stored in the gallbladder and released into the intestines when we eat um, and they help in digesting the food. About 95% of the bile acids get reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and reused. When you don't have the terminal ileum, they don't get reabsorbed and they go into the colon. Um, and then this causes actually more water to come out of the colon. We call this a bile acid diarrhea. So we treat this by using bile acid binders to bind up those bile acids. Um, and then there's loss of intestinal hormones such as um, glucagon like peptide 2 or GLP 2. Um, these are normally produced by L cells that we have in the um, end of the small intestine and the proximal colon. So if you lose that part of the intestine, you're going to lose those L cells and you're going to have a deficiency of GLP 2. So what we focus on is the intestinal rehabilitation. Um, and we define this as maintaining fluid and nutrient balance to ensure adequate growth, promoting this process of intestinal adaptation. We want to minimize the risks from complications, and these are complications that are related to the underlying disorder, and then also complications from our management, complications from long-term parental nutrition. And our ultimate goal is to restore enteral autonomy, as well as oral autonomy, so really getting the children to eat by mouth, um, and then having freedom from TPN. Um, and we work together as a multidisciplinary team. Um, and this involves um, physicians that work for medical management, um, nurse practitioners and nurses that, that assist us in the medical management and central line care, um, dietitians that work with us for nutritional support and nutritional rehabilitation. And we also work closely with the surgeons uh, for restorative surgical procedures. So I'm going to go on to talk about the different medical management approaches. Um, so one that I mentioned before is this gastric acid hypersecretion, which we commonly see. Um, so for gastric acid hypersecretion um, and treating also these high output um, ostomies or, or high diarrhea outputs, um, we try using H2 blockers um, such as famotidine, um, and this can be added to the TPN or given enterally. Um, and then in pa some patients will also use proton pump inhibitors. Um, and some patients don't respond to these, and I have had some success in using the IV formulations um, in children that have very poor absorption. And they're anti-motility agents. So I mentioned before, one of the problems that we see is rapid transit. So we want to use these motility stopping agents to try to slow down um, the passage of the food so that there's more time for the food and nutrients to be absorbed. Um, loperamide is one of the most common medications that we use in these children, and we use it at much higher doses um, than might be used for other conditions. Um, and we give it up to four times a day. And this allows the small intestine more time to absorb the water and the nutrients. And a couple of the important points over here is that there's a liquid formulation of loperamide um, that actually contains um, sorbitol, which is an artificial sweetener that can actually worsen diarrhea. Um, I don't know why it exists, to be honest, but it, it does. And we want to make sure that patients are not using this. It's over the counter as well. Um, so we prefer to use the tablets that can be crushed and given or the capsules that can be opened up. Um, timing of medication is very important. It works much better if it's given 30 minutes before a meal. Um, and as I said before, we do use much higher doses. So if children aren't responding because they have such poor absorption, you can go up to a certain extent. Um, again, just when you're looking at medications, these are things that you want to avoid. Any of the medications that end in ITO bell, those are those artificial um, sugar alcohols that will worsen the diarrhea. Bile acid sequestrants are useful for patients that have bile acid diarrhea. 
So cholestyramine is one that we use most commonly. Um, it comes in a powder form. We try to give it in divided doses. Um, it gets tricky if you try to give it three times a day because it can um, prevent the absorption of some other medications and fat soluble vitamins. So it should be med other medications should be taken one hour before or four hour after um, the administration of cholestyramine. So when it gets very tricky, a lot of times we'll just do like a middle of the day dosing of cholestyramine um, and that can be beneficial. Um, and it does work best if patients have a colon because again, part of what we see is that, that those bile acids that go into the large intestine then cause water to pour out. Um, it can be tried in other patients and it just might not work. Um, and then there's a version of this that's um, FDA approved in adults, which comes as a tablet. Soluble fiber is something that we've started to use more and more over the last few years. Um, and this is beneficial in two ways. So the soluble fiber, first of all, will thicken up the stool. So again, the thicker it is, the slower the transit time will be, the greater the chance for absorption. Um, and soluble fibers also help to stimulate the colon. Uh, they're short chain fatty acids that get fermented in the colon, especially butyrate. Um, and they serve um, as energy for the colonocyte. So they actually help the colon absorb better. One that we like to use is called pectin. Um, so this is used for jam, um, to make jam and it's actually bought in a regular grocery store. There's a liquid and a powder version. Uh, we prefer the liquid version. We, we played around with mixing and it seems to mix much better into formula or water. So we can dose it as one teaspoon per four ounces of formula or water, um, or we can titrate it up as a percentage of what the child is getting. We start at 1% and then titrate up to 3%. Um, and again, it just helps make it a little bit thicker. So it can be put into any liquid that the child um, is consuming. Another one that can be used is a guar gum based one called Benefiber. Um, these can be titrated to effect. They do work best with a colon, but can be tried in other patients as well. Um, and one note over here is that they can delay gastric emptying. So if you have a child that is vomiting a lot, um, you might be more cautious with using this. Salt. So salt is very important because it helps the intestines absorb um, water. So we can give this as salt tablets. Um, we usually start off with half a tablet in the younger babies and then move on to one, um, one full tablet, which is one gram twice a day. Um, the easiest thing to do is when the children are feeding is actually to just add iodized table salt. Um, the reason that I say iodized is because we want children to get a source of iodine. So we wanna make sure there are a lot of alternatives um, to iodized salt that we just wanna avoid um, because the children are not getting iodine from anywhere else. Um, so really just sprinkling the food with salt, um, or sometimes if we need more, we'll actually dose it. And I, I put the conversion over here. Um, in really small babies, sometimes we have seen the sodium levels go up. So that's something you just wanna watch. Um, and we often do recommend monitoring urine sodium values, um, especially in children that have an ostomy, because it's a more accurate measurement of your total sodium amount um, that's in the body versus a serum sodium level. Sodium bicarbonate is something that I recommend that patients just have at home. Um, it doesn't need to be given to everybody as a, on a routine basis, but it can be helpful, especially if you have abnormalities in blood work, um, especially for children that are on PN, if the bicarbonate level comes back low. Um, an easy way to fix this at home is just to give a little bit of, of baking soda. Um, so it's just have it handy. Um, and then if the child has chronically low um, CO2 levels, we can give by citra or sodium bicarbonate tablets to help correct this. Oral antibiotics, um, we do frequently use. Uh, these children are at very high risk for having small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. Um, it's tricky to diagnose in patients with short bowel syndrome. Um, and that's because in, in patients that have full anatomy, you can do a lactulose breath test where you ingest a lactulose solution. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a machine that can measure um, your breath and looking for hydrogen or methane production. Um, and all of the measurements that we have, um, the references are based on normal intestinal transit. Um, and what we're looking for is a peak um, where we think that the solution will reach the small intestine. So if you have bacteria that are producing these gases in the small intestine, we say, okay, that's because you have bacterial overgrowth bacteria that are not supposed to be present in the small intestine. In children with short bowel syndrome, we know the transit is very different in every single child, so we can't use any of those reference values. Um, so we'll often diagnose it just based on clinical symptoms. Um, so that can be abdominal pain, distension, diarrhea, vomiting, um, and poor growth. And these are many of the symptoms of short bowel syndrome itself. Um, so it often takes some time to, to really 
kind of fine tune and know when the child is having these symptoms. And it's usually when there's a change. So let's say the child is doing really well tolerating feeds, and then all of a sudden they're not. So we say, okay, maybe this is an episode of bacterial overgrowth. We'll try treating you with antibiotics. If it helps, then you can say, aha, okay, that was an episode of bacterial overgrowth. And now we're going to know for the future. Um, I don't like to keep children on antibiotics all the time because it can promote resistance. So we'll often um, take breaks or try to cycle with other antibiotics. Uh, metronidazole or flagell is the most common one that we use. Um, it's tricky to get as a liquid. Um, so that sometimes is a challenge. It doesn't taste very good, but it can be compounded into a liquid form given either by mouth or through a feeding tube. Um, and then rifaximin is a non-absorbable antibiotic that sometimes we are able to get covered by insurance. It's a little bit harder in the younger children, um, but it can be beneficial. So oftentimes we'll try different antibiotics um, and we're kind of fishing in the dark because we don't know what those abnormal bacteria are. Um, the only real way to test for it is by doing an endoscopy and actually doing an analysis of the fluid that's in the small intestine. Um, and that is not available at every institution and it is invasive and requires anesthesia. Uh, so we, we don't do it routinely. And then moving on to the intestinal hormones. Um, so GLP-2 or glucagon-like peptide 2. Um, again, this is a hormone that we have that is made at the end of the small intestine and the proximal large intestine. Um, and its job is to enhance intestinal growth. So tadouglutide or GATEX um, is a, a GLP-2 analog. Um, and it was approved by the FDA in 2019 for children with short bowel syndrome who are dependent on parental support. So this is either parental nutrition or intravenous fluids. Um, and the aim of tadouglutide is to increase the absorptive capacity in order to yield decreases in the requirements of parental support. Um, and the benefits of this are the less parental support you have, the less exposure to the PN constituents, less manipulation of the central line, lower risk of infection, and more time for us to focus focus on oral rehabilitation strategies. So this is just going through the study that led to the approval. Um, we were part of this study at Columbia. This was a 24 week double blind safety efficacy and pharmacodynamic study. Um, we looked at two different doses of tadouglutide in 59 children aged one to 17 years. The children received either 0.025 milligrams per kilo or 0.05 milligrams per kilo of tadouglutide. Um, and there was also a standard of care arm. Um, and when everybody continued to receive standard of care throughout the, the clinical trial. And then we looked at the results at 24 weeks in the children that received the higher dose of 0.05 milligrams per kilo per dose. And we found that 69% of the patients were able to achieve our primary endpoint, which was at least a 20% reduction in the volume of parental support. Overall, children needed 42% less volume of parental support. They were able to wean parental support by three hours per day on average. Um, and 38% were able to cut down at least one day a week. 12% were able to achieve the ultimate outcome, which is enteral autonomy, completely weaning off of parental support. It's given, um, so first of all, it's indicated for children over one year of age and who are over 10 kilos with short bowel syndrome who are dependent on parental support, again, either parental nutrition or intravenous fluids. The dose is the same for every child um, unless they have renal impairment. So that is 0.05 milligrams per kilo per dose once a day as a subcutaneous injection. Um, in renal failure, the dose is cut in half to 0.025 milligrams per kilo per day. Some common side effects that we see include abdominal pain and distension. This usually occurs in the first few weeks um, after starting GATEX, and it's usually a sign that the medication is working. Um, and adults will often report that they actually feel this after they get the injection. They feel like there's increased blood flow to the intestines and as if something is kind of stretching. Um, usually the symptoms are mild and they do go away on their own or with some dietary manipulations. Um, and then there are five main warnings and precautions. Um, luckily, we don't really see a lot of these in children, um, but it's something that is important to be aware of both for the, for the caregivers and the providers. Um, there is a potential risk of acceleration of neoplastic growth. So looking at, at the phrasing of this, this is, does not say this causes cancer. It only accelerates, potentially accelerates if there's some already dysplastic cells. So if there's something already abnormal, it is a growth factor. So like any growth factor, it can cause it to grow. Um, and for that reason, we are aware of this and we do screening and we do monitoring um, that if we do see something, we catch it early and treat it. Intestinal obstruction 
is very rare, but it can happen as the intestines are growing. So again, important to be aware of this. If the child is having symptoms of potential obstruction, you wanna hold the GATEX um, and get imaging as clinically indicated. Um, biliary and pancreatic disease, so we monitor for this in blood work. Um, fluid imbalance and fluid overload can occur. Um, so this is because the intestines on GLP-2 supplementation are increasing their absorptive capacity. So if you're absorbing a lot more of the fluid that you're getting enterally, and we don't make changes to the parental support, these children can become fluid overloaded. So it's very important for children on GATEX to have very close follow-up um, with their team. And similarly, there can also be increased absorption of oral medications that have a narrow therapeutic index. Again, if your intestines are suddenly working much better to absorb, um, and this can potentially cause an increase of, of a medication. So it's very important if children are on these types of medications, and this is usually medications like Coumadin or seizure medications, it's important to talk to their, their specialist and just let them know that your child is starting on GATEX and that you need to be aware that this could potentially be um, increased. Um, and I have had a child that I've had to decrease um, medication on because they were, they were getting sleepier and we knew this was an effect. We checked the level of the medication, it was too high, we cut it down. So again, it's very important just to be aware of these things and most importantly, just have very close follow-up with the team, um, both for looking at for, for these potential um, side effects as well as using every clinical visit as an opportunity to try to wean parental support because that, that is the whole point of why we're using this medication. Um, and a big complication that we used to see and luckily don't see as much of um, is intestinal failure associated liver disease. Um, this term was changed from TPN cholestasis because we recognize that there is something inherent to children that have intestinal failure that causes them to have uh, more liver disease. Um, and this is multifactorial. It has to do with prematurity. And it also has to do um, with episodes of sepsis, bacterial overgrowth, um, where bacterial toxins get produced and can damage the liver. The typical presentation will be a young child usually that's on parental support that is jaundiced, has um, elevated direct bilirubin, liver enzymes, um, and a high GGT. This will occur in about 40 to 60% of children on long-term PN. The longer children are on parental nutrition, the greater the chance of this developing. Again, it's multifactorial. As I said, the prematurity, the PN constituents can act as actual toxins, bacterial endotoxins from episodes of sepsis and SIBO, insufficient enteral feeding. So if we don't feed the intestines, we don't stimulate the enteral hepatic circulation. Um, and this can lead to, to liver disease. So that's one of the most important interventions that we can make is stimulating the intestines, even if it's just with trophic feeds. How do we manage it? So first of all, looking at what we're giving in the parental nutrition, we wanna make it hepatoprotective so we can limit the amount of copper and manganese. Uh, we don't wanna take copper out completely, but we wanna limit it and, and watch for it, the levels in the blood work. Cycle TPN, so the less hours of TPN, the more protective that is for the liver. Um, and then the lipids that we're, we're giving. Uh, we used to only have intralipid available and that's a soybean-based um, lipid emulsion. Now we have other ones available, SMOF lipid, um, which is a combination um, of soybean, MCT, olive oil, and fish oil, and Omegavan, um, which is fish oil-based. We wanna avoid giving too much glucose. Um, so one thing that we used to do in the past was cutting down the intralipids, so giving less fat. And we had to compensate for that by giving more dextrose. So if you think about what causes fatty liver disease, that's too much dextrose leading to insulin resistance. So we were causing the same problem in these children. So we want to avoid giving too much dextrose and really trying to give these kids a balanced um, solution of parental support. There are medications that we can use, such as ursodiol, to help flush out the bilirubin from the body. Again, enteral nutrition, very, very important. We'll, we'll go more into this in a minute. And then we also want to do an evaluation for non-nutritional causes. Um, children might have other causes of liver disease, so we want to make sure we're not missing that. So just talking a little bit about the parental nutrition components. Um, so in, intralipid, which is the only one that we had available for many years, again, soybean-based, um, and it provides omega-6 fatty acids. Um, so they're essential fatty acids, acids um, that are omega-6 and omega-3. We call these essential fatty acids because the body does not produce them. We only get them from external nutrition sources. We need omega-6, but the problem is when we're giving it as a soybean-based emulsion alone, it has pro-inflammatory effects. Um, and it contains something called phytosterols that, can, that are directly toxic to the liver and can reduce bile um, secretion and increase oxidative stress. 
So we tried to focus more on omega-3 fatty acids, which come from the fish-based lipid emulsions. Um, these, in contrast to omega-6 soybean-based ones, have anti-inflammatory effects, um, insulin-sensitizing effects, so we've been promoting um, the, the, you know, the, the opposite effects of insulin resistance, so insulin-sensitizing, so the insulin can work better, um, and they do not contain the phytosterols. So we generally will use um, small fluid in, in our patients. Um, one caveat is that it's not FDA approved in children yet, it is FDA approved in adults, um, but we are using it off label. Um, we are trusting the data that is existing from Europe for many years and trusting our colleagues that tell us that it's perfectly safe. Um, and we have seen much better results. Um, so again, it's a combination of soybean, which is providing the omega-6, which the body does need, MCT oil, which is a source of um, rapidly available energy that comes um, from, from coconut oil, olive oil, which is a healthy like Mediterranean diet type of oil, and fish oil, which is providing that omega-3. And if you think about what a typical diet will contain, a healthy Mediterranean diet, you really need a little bit of all of these fats. Um, in children that have severe liver disease, we will use Omegavan, which is the fish oil-based lipid emulsion that is FDA approved in children. Um, we'll often use it as a rescue therapy for children that have severe liver disease. I wanna move on now to talk about management of central lines. Um, so there's, this is um, a, a doll that is actually made by a woman who lives in England. Um, I found her on Facebook. She makes these adorable dolls. Unfortunately, does not ship to the US, um, but it's a great idea. So she makes them individualized for the children, depending on what kind of tubes they have. Um, so I, there's a paper that we put out um, that's a position paper from the Naspigan Intestinal Rehabilitation Special Interest Group. So if anybody is interested in learning more about this, um, I recommend that you take a look at our paper. So we talk about management of central venous access in children with intestinal failure. I'm just going to highlight a few things. One of the common complications that we see in children that have a central line is central line associated bloodstream infections. Um, the typical presentation will be a child that presents um, with fever, let's say they have ear pain and they have a central line. They go to the emergency department. What do we do with a child like this? Let's say they have an ear infection. Do we just give them antibiotics and send them home? The answer is no. Anytime you have a central line and a fever, we have to make sure it's not a central line infection. You can have a central line infection and have COVID. You can have a central line infection and have RSV. You can have a central line infection and have strep throat. And central line infections can be very severe, so we have to take any fever seriously. So that's an automatic admission to the hospital. We check blood cultures, um, making sure that the child does not have bacteremia and sepsis. We check a culture from the central line and we check a peripheral culture as well. Um, and then we wanna provide antibiotic coverage, looking for common pathogens that result in, in infection. So we have our gram-positive bacteria. Those are bacteria such as strep and staph that live on all of our skin. Um, so they can get, if we're not having good protection of the central line, they can get into the central line just from the skin. Um, and then we want to provide gram-negative coverage. So these are bacteria that are coming from the intestines or coming from stool contamination of the central line. Some patients that have had a history of fungal infections in the past, we will empirically treat them with antifungal coverage um, because fungal infections can be very serious. And if also if a patient comes in very, very sick, we will cover them with antifungal medication. And we want to focus on prevention, so really good line care, um, and then different lock solutions, which I'll go into next. So just touching on what we've done for, for prevention of central line infections in these children, when we look about 10 years ago, the rate was about 8 to 10 infections per 1,000 catheter days. Um, we report these types of infections per 1,000 catheter days. Um, and this can be due to translocation. Um, which can happen more commonly in children that have short bowel syndrome, meaning that the bacteria in the intestines will translocate into the bloodstream. Um, and then patients with liver disease as well, that also plays a role in this. Um, now the rate is about less than two infections per 1,000 catheter days. We've done a better job at protecting the liver. We have multidisciplinary programs um, where we have nurses or nurse practitioners that work closely with us for, uh, to promote better line care. We have CBC bundles, again, promoting that better line care, um, making sure that everything is done in, in, in a clean and sterile way and antimicrobial locking solutions. So the most common one that we used for years was 70% ethanol locks. Um, this can denature the biofilm. So the biofilm is bacteria that, that forms um, in the central line, usually within 24 hours. 
So we want to just take it's essentially taking alcohol inside the line and just cleaning it. Um, it has a broad spectrum of activity. There's no resistance to ethanol ox. Um, some concern has been brought up for line breakage and occlusions. In studies that were done, they didn't really see this, but it can potentially occur. Um, sometimes I think it happens because we usually recommend taking out the ethanol lock. Um, sometimes you get resistance when you're trying to do that. So people might be a little bit too aggressive with the line and that can cause it to break. Um, it's perfectly safe to flush the ethanol locks in. Ethanol used to be very cheap, which is why we really liked using it. Um, and then in 2020, um, there was a company that got a patent on ethanol locks for a cardiac condition. Um, and the price went up um, extremely, extremely high. So most home care companies were providing ethanol locks as part of their bundle of care for TPM patients, and it just became way too expensive. Um, so we've actually been using compounding pharmacies that can make ethanol locks for us. So they take 100% dehydrated um, ethanol and they can compound it for us in a sterile way, making these ethanol locks. Um, sometimes it's covered by insurance, when it's not, um, there's, there is a, a copay, um, usually not too expensive, roughly like $60 a month, um, compared to about $10,000 it, it cost it to get it from um, the, like the actual company. Antibiotic locks can be used. Um, they can cause resistance, so we don't like using them for prevention. Um, they sometimes can be used to kind of clear the infection while it's occurring, but we don't like using it for preventing infections on a recurrent basis. In Europe, they have something called tyrolidine locks, um, which we don't have available in the US, um, but they are antimicrobial and they prevent the biofilm formation. In Canada, um, they've been using something called the kite lock. They call this the triple threat. So it has an antimicrobial function. It disrupts the biofilm and it's also an anticoagulant, uh, which is helpful because one of the concerns that we have is occlusions with the line. There's no known resistance, but it's not yet approved in the US. Um, many centers are trying to get this approved or using it for compassionate use in the US right now. How do we manage catheter occlusion? So another common presentation that we see is a six month old coming to the ER, central line's not working, face looks a little bit puffy. So anytime the face is puffy, we're concerned that there's blockage of blood flow. Um, so these occlusions can be either from a thrombus or they can be something mechanical with the line. Um, so this is what we have put together in our papers. You can take a look at it there as well as here. So if you suspect an occlusion, First thing you wanna do is evaluate for a mechanical obstruction. So maybe you have the dressing on too tight, maybe the clamp is, 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 is closed. Um, so kind of taking a look at everything and making sure um, that there's no external obstruction. Sometimes just changing the patient's position can open it up, so like lifting the arm up. Then we wanna evaluate for precipitants, um, see if there are any incompatibilities. Um, we have to be careful with IV medications that we give because a lot of them can cause precipitation in the parental nutrition. Then the next step would be getting a chest x-ray, taking a look at the position of the line. Um, and if we think that it is a suspected thrombus, we can use TPA, um, which breaks down the, the clots. Um, we'll often have patients do this at home, um, depending on the age of the child. Usually in younger children, it's safer for them to come and get this done in the emergency room. Um, and then if we can't figure this out, we get further imaging, such as an ultrasound or an MRI to take a look at the vessels. If we diagnose a thrombosis, we will treat it for, with Lovenox for six weeks. Um, in some patients, we will continue Lovenox just to prevent future um, clots from forming. And then we really want really good flushes of the line, especially after medications. Um, and in some patients, we will use heparin locks. Um, so let's say we have a patient on ethanol locks, they're getting recurrent clots. We might alternate doing a day of ethanol or doing um, a day of, of heparin locks. We can't use ethanol and heparin together because they will precipitate. Um, so if you are going to use them on the same day, it's very important after you withdraw or flush in the ethanol locks to have a really, really good normal saline flush and then lock the line with heparin. Another common complication that we see is catheter breaks. So this would be usually when, when the TPN is being connected or taken down, that parent will notice that there's a moist dressing over the central line or they'll see an actual break in the external portion of the catheter. So as, as gastroenterologist, we want to give instructions over the phone. So you want to make sure that you're clamping the line. If there's any bleeding, you want to make sure that you're clamping above where the break is, covering it with a sterile gauze, and then coming into the emergency room right away. And you want to make sure that you're going to an emergency room that knows how to handle this. Um, one problem that we've seen is that if people go to an emergency room that is not experienced with short bowel syndrome and central lines in children, they'll see a broken line. They won't know how to repair it. The instinct will be to just take out the line, put a new one in. And that's fine for somebody who's on 
antibiotics through a line for a couple of weeks and doesn't need this line long-term. That's not okay in children that have short bowel syndrome. In children that have short bowel syndrome, we have to preserve the access as much as we can and save each line. So it's much better to always try to repair the lines. Anytime a line is pulled, it's a potential loss of access. And there are only so many access points that we have to give parental support. Um, and even if the line needs to be replaced for a break, um, it can be replaced over a catheter so that you're still preserving that same site. So again, really, really making sure that you're going to a center that is experienced with this. Um, and I wanna just touch upon how we dress the line because um, this is a common issue that we see. So we wanna try to prevent it from breaking in the first place. So you see over here where I'm pointing to the cursor, this is the thin portion of the line. And you kind of think about it like an iPhone charger. So you have a, a charger that, I'm trying to find my iPhone charger, but we have an, a charger, the connection, hold on, I'm going actually to get one. Second. Just want to do some demonstration. Okay, so we have the thin portion. Think of this as a thick portion of the line, the thin. Where do iPhone chargers break? It bends over here all the time. If this bends constantly or the line is twisting on itself, that line is going to crack and break. So we want to secure this portion of the line as much as possible so that there is no movement whatsoever in the line. So really coiling it, we call that a safety loop. So we coil it so that if somebody pulls on the line, it doesn't just come out. So you have a loop preventing it from being pulled. Um, and then the thin part and the thick part always needs to be underneath the dressing. This is extremely important. And then you also want to prevent the small child from being able to access the line. Children think it's a toy, they will chew on it, they will pull on it, they will, they will get wrapped around and coiled when they're sleeping. One thing that we like to use is gust care. Um, and there are also homemade versions that can be made. Um, and there's some cheaper versions of this as well. It's kind of like a vest. So it has an opening where the line can be secured inside and it's easy to access. We also want to prevent contamination of the connections of the line. Um, so one thing that can be used is GLAD pressing scale. So this is bought at any grocery store. It's a, a fancy form of saran wrap that sticks on itself. So you can wrap the connection of the line when it's not being used. And also when the child is on parental nutrition, um, that connection can just be wrapped around. So that way, if the child has a massive diarrhea episode that leaks out of the diaper or an ostomy bag falls off, the line is protected. Um, there's also a version of this called parafilm, which is more expensive, but that comes out in like these pre-cut squares that can be wrapped around the line. Okay, moving on to talk about nutrition, which is so important in these children. We divide nutritional management into three phases. Stage one is the acute phase. So this is in the first uh, one to three weeks after the surgical resection. Um, in this point, we're really focusing on hydration and electrolyte management and the child will need parental support during this time. Then we move on to stage two, which is the adaptation phase. This is a point where we really wanna focus on promoting intestinal adaptation. I'm really judiciously introducing enteral nutrition, even if it's just trophic feeds and focusing on different medications and different approaches to try to decrease the diarrhea. And stage three is a maintenance phase. Maintenance phase. So this is a period of complete bowel adaptation where enteral nutrition is well tolerated. So parental nutrition, I just wanna say that a lot of people think that this is like the big evil, the big bad, and we focus so much on trying to wean parental nutrition. We do have to acknowledge that without parental nutrition, these children would not be alive. So parental nutrition has such an important role in really saving these children when they're very sick. Um, but we then have to ju judiciously decrease it. And when we're able to use the gut, use the gut so that we can decrease the parental nutrition, because like I mentioned before, it does have long-term effects. So again, the therapeutic key is to feed the gut as soon as possible to help stimulate it. And this also helps promote the process of intestinal adaptation. Oral feeding. So we all want the children to feed by mouth whenever they can. It's physiological, it's pleasurable part of culture. Um, as caregivers, especially, it's such a big role for parents to be able to feed their children. Um, and it also plays a very role for the intestines, big role for the intestines. So there's secretion of GI trophic factors that get released when we feed by mouth um, and more so than when we're feeding through a tube. It minimizes feeding disorders. Uh, so we wanna introduce this as soon as medically stable. One common problem that we see is oral aversions. Um, and this often happens because these children are not able to feed um, early on in life and they do lose that suck reflex. They lose the mechanism of swallowing. 
a lot of times these children will also have other complications such as chronic lung disease. They might be intubated or have a trach and it prevents them from being able to feed until they're much older. So prevention is really key. Um, we wanna focus on early um, feeding therapy, even if it's just stimulation. So that can be with a pacifier. If the child is able to take it, it can be pacifier dips in either breast milk or formula. Um, and really working with a feeding therapist and because we don't, we don't want to get to a point where the child is doing well, they're able to feed, but they just have such an aversion. Another part of an aversion is that children don't find feeding to be pleasurable. These are kids that are often having belly pain, diarrhea, vomiting, so they just don't associate it with anything pleasurable at all. So we're really working with a, a speech therapist and occupational therapy can also be, play a big role um, in just getting over that fear that these children have. And then we also have to take to think about could there be other causes of this oral aversion? So a lot of times children can have allergic conditions of the esophagus, that's called eosinophilic esophagitis. It's actually more common in kids that have short bowel syndrome. So these kids might need an endoscopy to look for that condition. Um, and then could they have a stricture? Could that be preventing them from, from eating? So doing contrast image. What do we feed by mouth? So we wanna promote a diet that's high in protein, that's moderate in fats, um, and high in complex carbohydrates, high in soluble fiber. As I mentioned before, the soluble fiber helps stimulate um, the, col the colonocytes to absorb better. What we don't wanna feed um, is just water. So we wanna avoid that um, as a, the main source of, of, of hydration in these patients because water just runs right through and it can actually cause more output. We definitely don't want juice. So I am anti-juice for everybody. It has no nutritional benefits and should especially not be given in these children. Um, you don't want to have a, a case where your child is drinking six cups of grape juice and then is on high doses of loperamide. That just doesn't make sense. So there are a lot of manipulations that we can make to the diet. And you want to work very closely with a dietitian to come up with the best diet for the child. Um, and there are oral rehydration solutions that are commercially available, such as Pedialyte, that has a balanced amount of sugar and salt. Um, so that is really what we want to focus on for hydration. Um, some kids don't like the taste of it, so you can make your own version at home. Um, this is, are some recipes over here. One that is, is very popular and easy is just taking G2, um, which has less sugar than regular Gatorade, and adding a little bit of salt to it, and that makes it a more balanced solution with the sugar and the salt. And again, you can make your own version and flavor it as you wish with Crystal Light. So again, enteral nutrition promotes intestinal adaptation. How do we feed oral versus tube feeding? It's still quite controversial. Um, in the US, we do focus a lot on tube feeding because we prefer feeding the gut and promoting intestinal adaptation versus having more parental support. So we'll often have a mix. Um, we'll do some continuous feeds, some bolus feeds. Um, there are pros and cons to each one. Uh, it's best to just start with trophic feeds and start with slow amount of continuous feeds. And then the goal would ultimately be to increase it to daytime um, PO or bolus feeds, which are more physiologic and the kids can have break for school or therapies, um, and then overnight continuous feeds, um, which can be better tolerated. Blenderized tube feeds are a very big thing that a lot of parents like to, to do. Um, so this can be your own homemade version. Um, so if you are going to do this, you if you wanna do this as, a, as, you, as your, the sole source of nutrition, it's extremely important to work closely with a dietitian to come up with a feed that has all the right macronutrients and micronutrients that is really nutritionally appropriate. There are commercially available forms of this as well. Some things that work really well are green beans, sweet potatoes, plantains. Those can be mashed up, put in a blender, add some water added to it and put through a G2. That can greatly help with, with um, diarrhea. We focus a lot on micronutrients as well. So when you've had an intestinal resection, you're at high risk of having vitamin deficiencies. Some of the common ones that we see are iron deficiency, fat soluble vitamins, so that's vitamin A, D, E, and K, vitamin B12, which is absorbed in the terminal ileum. When you lose a terminal ileum, you can have vitamin B12 deficiency. Zinc and copper are common deficiencies and then essential fatty acids. Uh, so a lot of these can be checked just in routine blood work. And then if there are any symptoms of complications from these, it's important to, to have this blood work checked um, and these nutrients um, supplemented. So talking about survival, um, so we look back into 1968, which is really the time when, when parental nutrition really started becoming an entity. Um, the overall survival rate was only 54%. When TPN was introduced, um, it immediately reduced deaths that were due to dehydration and malnutrition. And today, about 80% of children will be off parental support. Um, it can take a couple of years and there's about 90% survival. So we've definitely come a long way. 
one of the things that has helped is a multidisciplinary approach. So this is coordinating surgical, medical, nutritional, um, and developmental management. Um, studies have looked at just introducing a multidisciplinary team. This can improve survival by, by itself, just having everybody work together to care for these patients. And who is part of this team? So at the center, first of all, is the patient. And then we need a gastroenterologist, we need the surgeon, we need dietitians, a pharmacist, nursing, nurse practitioners, social workers, we need the pediatrician, we need the caregivers. We need to all work together to prevent all of these complications. And you can see when you look at all of these things, so we have some of the complications that I talked about. And then we also wanna remember that we have to maintain age appropriate development um, and focus on quality of life. Um, as we're doing a much better job caring for liver disease, caring for central lines, we wanna focus more on having the child grow and develop uh, as much as we can. So this is an overview of our Pediatric Intestinal Rehabilitation Center at Columbia. Um, so I lead the team. I have an associate director who's a pediatric gastroenterologist. We also work closely um, with a hepatologist, Dr. Martinez, who's also the medical director of our intestinal transplant program. We focus again on intestinal rehabilitation. So we try to rehabilitate the intestines as much as we can. There are going to be times when children will need transplants. So it's good to have a transplant center close by and have a good connection with them um, and at least get an evaluation done early so that parents can hear about intestinal transplant and see if their child would need it and at what point they would need it. We work very closely with our surgeons, um, our nursing team, our dietitians, and our social worker. Um, some people look at my diagram that I made here and say, well, you know, why is our social worker the rectum? She's actually not the rectum. She is, I like to think of her as our ileocecal valve because she, she kind of stops things. She kind of really evaluates the patients um, and can really prevent a lot, of, a lot of complications just by having that social worker find um, you know, different types of support for our families. So where are we today? So medical management to duplicate has greatly changed um, how we're approaching these patients and we're patients that are good candidates for GLP-2, we will try it with them. Um, we are trying to optimize central line care, decreasing central line infections. Um, with ethanol locks that we, we can still get um, and other types of solutions that we're working on. We wanna prevent and treat cholestasis with um, the newer lipid emulsions, closely monitoring for complications and micronutrient deficiencies. Working together as a multidisciplinary team does improve survival. Um, it, we also wanna decrease emergency department visits, decrease hospital admissions and unnecessary outpatient visits. So doing as much as we can at home. Um, and with COVID, we started incorporating telehealth more and more into our practice. We also want to focus on bone health, um, increasing patient travel. This was a, a big thing that we were working on before COVID started, uh, but patients can travel. We want you to have a good quality of life, travel with your families. We just have to plan. We have to know ahead of time and you have to travel to a location that has a hospital in case there is an emergency. It's always better to plan. Some ongoing challenges are that we still have lack of evidence and cons consensus in many aspects of management. Um, so there are international registries that are being led from uh, the team in Canada. We still need to work on preventing short bowel syndrome in the first place. So there's a lot of research that needs to go into that. We don't understand enough about the microbiome and what potential role probiotics could play. We can't use probiotics in patients that have a central line, it's not recommended. Um, but potentially in patients that don't have the central line in place, you know, maybe probiotics could help with um, the dysbiosis that we see, but we still don't know enough about that. We wanna optimize the remnant intestinal function, promoting adaptation with the intestinal hormones, better surgical techniques, working more to prevent complication, preventing and manage, uh, managing the oral aversion, and again, focusing on quality of life, mental health, and neurocognitive outcomes. What does the future hold? Could there be an artificial intestine that is made that would avoid the complications from transplant? It's possible, but we, we are unfortunately not there yet. But the key is really working as a multidisciplinary team um, and listening to our patients and their caregivers. And again, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to speak at a conference and a webinar such as OLI that really incorporates um, the families into these discussions. So thank you so much for your attention. And I went a little bit over, but we do have some time for questions.
Well, thank you, Dr. Kimberg. It was amazing as usual. Um, so what we're gonna do right now is, um, I think we're gonna take um, some speaker questions. Um, we have a little bit of time, um, but Dr. Kimberg was nice enough to um, actually offer to answer some of our questions we don't get to. So um, I will pass those on to her and then put those on the website as, um, soon as we can um, get those answered for you. So right now, we'll start taking a few. And if you haven't already done so, um, and you want to take um, an opportunity to get your question answered, or at least get it so that we can have it answered, if you want to put it in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your panel, that would be or bottom of your keyboard, that would be great. So right now, let's see if we can't get some of these answered for you. So uh, Dr. Kimberg, we have one. I'm wondering how come some patients after successful G-tube insertion, only a few weeks later, they may suddenly have a G-tube leaking. Is this a delayed complication? I understand there may be many etiology and causes that can lead to a leaking. So one of the common things that we see um, as a complication of G-tubes is granulation tissue that forms um, on the outside of the G-tube. And that can be from movement of the G-tube. Um, so we do recommend taking off the extensions when the G-tube is not being used um, and trying to secure it, the G-tube as much as possible to prevent that. Um, and then just having uh, your provider take a look at that G-tube site um, because leaking is a complication that we do see and it can happen in the beginning, it can happen years after having the G-tube. Um, and sometimes that means that the G-tube size needs to be changed. Um, so it's very important just to follow up with, with, with your, your doctor or your, or your either gastroenterologist or surgeon to help um, manage that. Excellent advice. Another question we have is you mentioned stimulation of the gut is helpful 24 to 48 hours post resection. Does this include trickle feedings via tube feeding? Yeah, so any, any stimulation that we can get of the gut and usually in the, in the beginning, um, most children after surgery are not able to feed by mouth. So we call that trophic feed. So that's trickling in a small amount um, of ideally breast milk if we have it, if not formula, um, and just stimulating the intestines. And even if it's a couple of cc's, if that's all they can tolerate, that is much better than nothing. And then we wanna just, as they're healing, try to increase that as much as we can. Excellent. Okay, we have another, oh, we have lots of questions coming in for you. Um, what is the max Imodium dose you recommend for pediatrics and adults? That's a good question, and, and different centers do this differently. Um, I'll usually go up to four milligrams per dose, so four milligrams um, four times a day, which is like 16 milligrams total for the day. Um, some people have pushed it higher. Um, there is some concern if you really go too high that it can have some side effects. Uh, so I would talk to, you, to your provider about that, but sometimes even just changing the timings. So if you're not doing it 30 minutes before a meal, even that small change or using the tablet form as opposed to the liquid can be effective. Okay. Um, there's a second part or a second question uh, from that attendee is, I recently tried Bicitra, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, B-I-C-I-T-R-A, um, and had to stop because there was sorbitol in it and incidentally noticed an increase in diarrhea. Is there another sodium bicarbonate product that can be taken orally other than pills or put in tube feedings? My connection cut out a little bit. I was just um, going to say, you froze on us for a minute. That's okay. <laughs> so I had in the slide, so the Bicitra is, is an easy one that can be prescribed, but there's also the sodium bicarbonate tablets, which can be taken, and baking soda. Everybody has it. It's cheap. It doesn't have much of a taste. You can just mix it into some water um, and take it either by mouth or through a tube. Excellent. It doesn't well, have well, anything well, else added to it. Yep. Perfect. Another question we have is, um, my son has short gut syndrome since gastroscesis repair at six months, and he is almost seven years old now. Recently, he was diagnosed with ulcers in his intestines and has been struggling with low hemoglobin levels and need for constant blood transfusions since he was diagnosed back in the summer of 2021. We are on Bactrim now, but still having low hemoglobin. What else could be causing his abnormal CBC levels? So it seems like it's probably um, the anemia is coming from those ulcers that are bleeding. Um, and that is something that we can see. Um, and it usually comes from 
either ischemia, so either there's poor blood flow to that part of the intestine that causes that ulcer, or it might come from inflammation. Um, in some children, we see a chronic intestinal inflammation that actually looks like Crohn's disease. Um, so the treatment has to be for, for that type of inflammation. Um, so I would recommend talking to your doctor and seeing if it's coming from inflammation, potentially using anti-inflammatory agents um, and not just the antibiotic to try to treat that. Um, and those can be severe, those can bleed. Um, and we definitely have seen that. So there are different medications that can be used um, to try to, again, to either target the inflammation or to try to coat the intestines. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, do you recommend lactose breath tests to rule out SIBO? So as I said before, that, so the, the lactulose breath test is what can be done um, for SIBO. Lactose breath test is actually for lactose intolerance. It's just a different solution. Um, but if, if you don't have a full intestinal tract, if you're missing part of the intestines, that lactulose breath test is not going to be accurate. Um, it's usually, we're usually going to get a lot of false positives. Um, sometimes we do it, just mostly it's when there's an insurance issue and we can't get the medication covered, usually the rifaximin. Um, we'll go through the process of doing the testing, but there are, it's very inaccurate in patients that have short bowel syndrome. Excellent. Another question we have are, what are your thoughts on the STEP procedure? That's a good question. I didn't put that in the talk because I was focusing more on medical management. Um, so the STEP procedure, for those that don't know, is a type of intestinal lengthening procedure. Um, there are mainly two different ones. There's a Bianchi lengthening where you, as I mentioned before, what happens in the process of adaptation is the bowel gets dilated, so it gets much wider. Um, and often when you have bowel that is wide, the motility is very poor. So when you have a narrow piece of intestine, the motility is great, it's moving all over. When it's big and wide, only the ends are moving. Um, and patients can have problems with tolerating feeds or bacterial overgrowth. Um, so what they do in the Bianchi procedure is they kind of, it's totally simplifying this, but they cut the intestines in half, connect it end to end. In the STEP procedure, you cut the intestines and, and, and staple at the same time, taking a big piece and kind of causing like a zigzag lengthened. Um, we used to do it more commonly. Um, I've heard from the surgeon that they are, it's not as popular as it used to be. Um, but it, it really depends on the child. So if you're at a point where you have dilated bowel that is not working, you're not able to advance feeds, um, we sometimes do have to consider surgical procedures. So I would recommend really having a surgical evaluation um, because there, there are other types of procedures that can be done as well. Sometimes they'll do a tapering procedure, which is just instead of having the bowel be dilated, just making it a little bit more narrow. Uh, but the step for some reason has become less popular in the last couple of years, uh, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, and sometimes the surgeons will try to avoid going into a belly from short bowel syndrome because all of these surger surgeries are going to be major surgeries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question we have is, my son came off TPN in August of this year, still has elevated liver enzymes. Is this a common occurrence? When could I expect them to normalize? So, yeah, so intestinal failure associated liver disease can, can take some time to get better. Um, so we tend to think of it more as cholestasis, but you can see elevated liver enzymes on their own. Um, I, it usually goes away and normalizes within say like about a year off of parental support. Um, but if they're staying elevated, you do want to pursue other causes. So having your doctor do a blood work evaluation, an abdominal ultrasound, um, and considering use of medications such as Versadyl mm -hmm. to try to help. And then also looking at other medications that your child might be on. Um, one common one is proton pump inhibitors that can cause elevation of liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. So again, checking for other causes and not, not just um, the, the, the cause from TPN itself. Great. Another question we have is, do you suggest an amino acid-based formula such as Elicare versus standard formula? Uh, and any recommendations on introducing solid food, foods after bowel resection? So there's a, a lot of controversy regarding which formula should be used. Um, when breast milk is available, we do recommend that um, that has been studied and looked at that it, it decreases the length on parental support. A lot of times breast milk is not available. Um, donor breast milk can be used in those cases. But when we are using formulas, we tend to go to the more hypoallergenic ones um, if a child is really not doing well and not, not tolerating feeds. Um, it doesn't mean that every child needs that. Um, and sometimes you can try a regular standard formula, especially if you're doing it by mouth, that tastes a lot better. Um, so it's definitely, you can definitely try. Um, there is some increase in cow's milk protein allergy um, in these patients. So some of them might need a hypoallergenic formula. Um, in terms of nutrition, they are very equivalent. 
Um, sometimes people think that the more intact the protein is, though, the more it stimulates the intestines. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a lot of trial and error. So you can, so you can try with a regular formula. If they don't tolerate it, then you can move on to a more broken down one. Great advice. And then answering the solids. So it's, that's a very good point. And it's very important to introduce solids at the right time. So around four to six months um, corrected gestational age is when we want to introduce solid food. Um, and after a surgical resection, we wait for clearance just from the surgeons because you want to make sure that the anastomoses, the connections are properly healed um, before introducing uh, formula and solid food. Uh, but they will definitely help with the stool and they will help stimulate the intestines. Great. Another question we have is you talked about Gatex a bit. When or do you suggest patients to try it? So um, it's approved for anyone that's over one year of age um, and over 10 kilos who's dependent on either parental nutrition or, or IV fluids. Um, and we, we tend to think about it when a child is not making progress. So if you have a child who is doing great, they're advancing fees, you're weaning parental support, they're not having complications, that's a child that you might say, okay, we'll wait a little bit and wait for your natural process of adaptation. Um, if you have a child that is not making progress or is having frequent line infections, is starting to run out of access, um, and you're starting to worry, will this child need intestinal transplant? That is definitely a child that you wanna consider Gatex for. Um, and it's a discussion that needs to be had. There are things that need to be monitored when you're on Gatex. Um, in general, it is very safe and the complications are very rare, you know, but it's, it's usually, again, for children that, that are not making progress. Um, and we are doing extra studies now um, that, that, that this will happen over the next few years. It's a post-marketing study that um, is involving multiple centers in the country to look at more long-term real-world data. So I think that's very exciting. We'll hopefully get more information from that. Very exciting. Okay, do you think we have time to squeeze in one more question? I have time, I have time for all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there anything that should be done uh, for yearly checkups to look out for complications and shortcut sensation? <laughs> such as regular ultrasounds, x-rays, or scopes? Really great question. Um, so especially in children that are growing, you do wanna do x-rays, um, depending on how quickly they're growing, I would say anywhere from every three months to once a year, just to check the placement of the line. Because um, children that are rapidly growing, that line might migrate out and it might not be central anymore. So I would say at least once a year, if not more often for the x-rays. Mm -hmm. um, if they're elevated liver enzymes, I do recommend doing an abdominal ultrasound, um, usually once a year. Um, we now have a new test at Columbia. I don't know if it's available in other places. It's called um, an, an ultrasound elastography of the liver. So it actually gives you more information about um, if there's any stiffness or potential fibrosis of the liver. Um, so that's a useful test. If, if your center does have that, I, I recommend having that done um, at least once a year. When things are abnormal, we need to repeat them sooner. Um, and then vitamin levels really need to be checked. Um, if you're on parental support, we generally do blood work every three to six months, um, looking for the fat-soluble vitamins, zinc, copper, iron, um, fat-soluble vitamins, um, and also looking for toxicity of certain elements in the parental nutrition. Um, aluminum is in some of the, the solutions that we use, it's in the glass containers, so we do have to look for aluminum toxicity. Um, so our, in our center, we have a protocol for how often we check this blood work. Um, one thing that's important is that children that get weaned off of parental nutrition, they still have the surgery, they, they, they still need to be monitored very closely for all of these things, um, especially the vitamins. Um, and then imaging, depending on how the child is doing. So if they're not making progress with feeds, they're vomiting, not tolerating, you might wanna do contrast studies, like an upper GI or a barium enema. Excellent, excellent. Um, what are your thoughts on the future? Innovations such as new devices and pharmaceuticals? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of research that's being done. Um, and I, you know, I have been saying that for several years now. Um, I think one of the big things that we've, we've had is the, the intestinal growth hormones. I think that that is a very exciting thing, especially that we have it approved in children now. Um, so I think probably more, more is to come with, with, with those types of hormones, um, especially when should they be used? It's being studied in babies as well. And we, we need more information about that because is this something that, should be given to all children. So when we think about what happens, again, when we lose part of the intestines, we're losing the cells that produce the, 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 that intestinal growth hormone. So the, and I don't have the answers to these things, but should we be giving the GLP-2 as a replacement to every child that has had an intestinal resection? Will it help um, 
that promote the intestinal adaptation process faster, require less parental support. So I think that's something that we definitely need to study. Um, and then there are surgeons in the country that are doing a lot of research on different devices as opposed to actually surgeries or different kinds of lengthening techniques um, that can be done. But I, th I think the, the thing that we, we've really been slow on is prevention of these conditions in the first place. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're working closely with neonatologists and trying to figure out what, how we can prevent some of these conditions in the first place. Yeah, excellent. Exciting things coming in the future. Um, okay. Oh goodness, we keep getting questions coming in. We'll take one more and then maybe maybe we'll uh, try it and close it up after that. Um, what hospitals are doing intestinal transplant on children? Um, so there are, there are several throughout the country. Um, so we, we do them at Columbia. Um, we, we definitely have a very big transplant program. Um, Pittsburgh is a big center as well. There, there are multiple, multiple centers throughout the country that do it. Um, Cincinnati does do transplant as well. I would say the most important thing is to see which center is closest to you um, and ask your, your doctor for a referral if you're interested in hearing about that. It doesn't mean that you're committing to anything. I think one of the mistakes that we make is referring patients to transplant too late. So you don't wanna to get to the point where the child is running out of access and they're very sick and that's when you're starting to talk about transplant. Um, and when we talk to transplant surgeons, they tell us that too, that we really have to make the referrals out early. Um, that Florida has a very big program as well. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there are many that exist throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of outcomes, I think they're, they're all pretty, very, pretty similar. Um, there are complications from transplant. It's unfortunately not perfect yet. So that's another big area that is being worked on. Um, if we want to, if we're transplanting intestines, we want to avoid newer, new complications that happen from that. Mm -hmm. So my, my biggest recommendation really would be just find the center that is closest to you and go for an evaluation if that's something that your doctor thinks you need. Excellent, excellent. Okay, we have one more question. Hopefully we can just squeeze this in quick under the wire. <laughs> uh, what might indicate a move to blended food like Nourish vers versus remaining on formula like Elecare? So when you're on the, the, the hypoallergenic formulas, we often find that the stools are very loose. Um, and that's just part of being on a very broken down formula. Um, so we, we definitely had a trend and we've seen a big improvement in children moving on to more of the, the blenderized diets. Um, so it can be done at any age. It's not like a certain cutoff that you have to be on the hypoallergenic for a certain amount of time. Um, you have to have a feeding tube that's big enough. So it has to be a 14 French or bigger for the, the blenderized foods to be able to go through it. Um, some people will dilute it a little bit with either Pedialyte or water, just because it's if, if they're having a hard time. Um, there are many different formulas that exist. So Nourish is one that you mentioned. Um, there's also one from Pedish for Pedish for Harvest. There's complete organic blends. There are real food blends. Um, we actually, as, as physicians, do get samples of all of these. So your oh. provider can get samples of all of these things. Um, and the company also can ship you some samples so you can try. Um, because what works for one child might not work for another. So I think the only way is to really you just do trial and error with it. Um, and you can do your homemade blends as well. I do encourage, you know, we, we talked about this, about this before, how it's feeding is physiological. It's part, uh, you know, of, of our, our culture. So having the child sit at the table when they're feeding and making them part of the family. And if you want to make some green beans or make some like chicken with mashed soup, as long as your doctor says it's okay, you can give that through the feeding too. That's excellent advice. Well, I think we might have to end the Q&A there. Um, I just want to let everyone know is that um, Oli does have several resources on our website, including our short bowel syndrome section, which offers several articles, patient consumer stories, and research. Um, we recently ran a webinar, the short bowel diet, um, and we also at our annual conference, um, just this past June, we dedicated a full day to short bowel syndrome. So those recorded presentations and the webinars and this recorded webinar will be on our website. Um, so please go ahead and check those out anytime. Um, and I want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Kimberg for joining us today. If you see the chat section, obviously everyone is, thank you so much for being here and really taking the time out and sharing your expertise with us today and for even us letting us run over um, our hour mark today. It's a, we thank you so much.
Um, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to our sponsor, Nine Meters Biopharma, for making this educational program possible. And a thank you to all our participants who joined us today. I will be posting this webinar on our website um, in case you'd like to see it again or share it with your colleagues and friends and um, other consumers. Um, we hope you'll join us for another webinar. Um, if you would like to go um, and look at our schedule, you can find that on um, Oli.org Community Enrichment Programs page. And as of that, this concludes our uh, webinar for today. I'd like to again say thank you to Dr. Kinberg and for everyone joining us and for Nine Meters Biopharma for hosting this. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and enjoys the holidays and stays safe. Take care, Thanks everyone. So Happy holidays, everyone. Take care.